are we? Yes. And this was during the invasion of France, the Battle of the Bulge. Your Honor. Now, I withdraw the question. No, I said that. I'm, I'm finished with the witness. Well, I am not finished. Mr. Cochran. Now, you have no right to twist the truth. Mr. Cochran. No right to destroy a man's life with your damned insinuations. Your Cochran, lies. You may sit down. Now, I ask, sir, if you had any other experience under fire with Dennis Corcoran during the war. Yes, sir, the raid on Dieppe. Why was Dennis Corcoran, an American, sent to cover a Canadian operation? Well, he volunteered. Uh, no, uh, he insisted is more the word. He'd already been turned down once, and then he received a letter. Previously offered as Exhibit 72. Would you be kind enough to read it? Certainly. To Dennis Corcoran, Connaught Hotel, London, my dear sir. I should like you to know how admirable I thought your article was last Sunday. I know that your words have given real pleasure and encouragement not only to me, but to a great many people on this island. Signed. Yours faithfully, Winston Churchill. Now, several days after that, you both embarked for the Dieppe Raid, a Canadian exploratory mission. Yes, sir. How did the mission go? It's well known it was a great disaster. Was your ship under attack? Heavy attack, sir. And did Denny remain on deck during the entire battle? Yes, sir. Except for when he was taking the wounded below for treatment. Ah. Would you say he performed his function under fire with the zeal, devotion, courage expected of a war correspondent? No. I would say he greatly exceeded the zeal, devotion, and courage at all times. Thank you, sir. Mr. Cleary, your witness. Colonel Douglas, isn't it true that one of the chief instruments in preparing American public opinion for sending aid to Britain and eventually joining in the war with Britain was Dennis Corcoran? As I remember it, sir, the United States entered the war when it was attacked at Pearl Harbor. Which would account for our going to war against the Japanese. Now, as to the second front, of which we've heard much in this trial, would you say that Denny did much to stir up fervor for it? And then was shunted to side to safety, here at home, while thousands of other Americans plunged into the slaughterhouse that was Omaha Beach. I object. Sustained. Colonel, did you testify that you were aboard the flagship uh, during the Dieppe adventure? I was. Then do you know whether any correspondence landed with the commando force? Yes, sir. Two Canadian correspondents landed with the troops. Did good old Denny land on the Dieppe coast, or did he remain aboard through the uh, whole operation? Having been assigned to the flagship, Denny had no choice. So, during the eight hours of the operation, during the time when several thousand Canadians were being massacred on the beach and in the streets of Dieppe, this brave, fearless knight of the typewriter was safely aboard with the big brass. I object to the word safely. Uh, Your Honor, the witness being a stranger to our courts obviously is not aware that the right to object is limited solely to counsel. Sir, Mr. Clary is right. I'm sorry, Your Lordship, I, uh, Your Honor. From what I had observed, I thought it was only the right to be objectionable that was limited to counsel. Answer the questions, please. Couldn't Denny have asked for the assignment that would put him ashore at Dieppe and not on the most protected vessel in the entire fleet? The flagship, sir, is the nerve center of the entire operation. And naturally the most protected. And being the flagship, it's a prime target for attack, did both she from the in, air did she and move Allow the, ship the, the witness to finish his answer. Hasn't he finished it? Mr. Clary. Now, Colonel, continue. Twenty-five percent of the men aboard the Cal P were casualties. Half of those dead. I remember at one point that an M.E. came in low, strafing the ship. And two young officers beside us were hit. Denny carried one of them below and I took the other. They were using the dining tables for surgery by that time. Uh, that will be all, sir. Colonel Douglas, is there something you wish to add? Uh, yes, Your Lordship. It strikes me now that I never did quite answer the questions about the relative safety of a flagship. Anyone who had seen them hosing the blood off the decks wouldn't need to ask the question. Now, Mr. Cleary, 
the defendant's case, if you will. Your Honor, I now call Mr. Boyd Bendix. Boyd Bendix? Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth and the whole truth, so help you God? So help me God. Please be seated. Be seated, Mr. Bennett. Uh, if Your Honor, please, there being no specific rule against it, I ask uh, the court to allow Mr. Bendix to stand while testifying. If Mr. Sloan has no objection, the court has none. We so welcome the sight of Mr. Bendix in the witness box that we'll take him any way we can get him. Thank you. Now, sir, your name? Boyd Bendix the second. Your profession? Journalist, columnist, writer of the truth, as I see it. Mr. Bendix, can you give us your personal creed as a newspaperman? To expose to the American people its enemies, whether they be on the right or the left, in big business or in big labor, in government or out. Would you consider immorality an American? Anything that destroys the fiber of the individual American eventually destroys America. So that in writing your articles complained of by the plaintiff, you were not concerned so much with writing about Dennis Corcoran as you were with informing the American people about certain evils? My object was to expose to the American people the truth about Corcoran and his fellow traveling friends who were bleeding this country white with one hand while painting it red with the other. Now, sir, how did you go about gathering the facts on Mr. Corcoran? Research. Endless reading and gathering of, uh, of, of articles and items and information concerning Mr. Corcoran and the public press for many years. Here it comes. Section 338 in all its gory glory. Now, sir, since I do not wish to tax the jury with endless articles, I am going to show you a mere handful. And I ask you if these are taken from your files and constitute part of the material on which you relied in writing your articles about Mr. Corcoran. I ask the court to instruct the jury each time Mr. Cleary puts such a piece of trash into evidence that its admission under Section 338 is not an endorsement of its truth, but that it is being admitted only in an attempt to minimize damage.